Welcome to Speaking Freely with the ACLU of Pennsylvania. I'm Andy Hoover, your host and director of communications at the ACLU of PA. The podcast took a long hiatus. We haven't had an episode in eight months, but it is great to be back and and having these conversations. I'm thrilled to be bringing you new episodes uh, and new conversations with our allies and some of my colleagues about the issues that are uh, right in front of us. We have several new episodes lined up for this spring, so be sure to keep an eye on your podcast app of choice and on our YouTube channel um, for the latest. The police tactic of stop and frisk is back in the news and has become a campaign issue in the 2023 elections in Philadelphia. Some candidates for mayor and for city council have suggested that escalating its use against pedestrians in the city should be on the table as a public safety measure. For 12 years, the ACLU of Pennsylvania and co-counsel from the law firm Carries, Radofsky, Messing, Feinberg, and Lynn have been enforcing a settlement in a 2010 lawsuit against the city over the aggressive, illegal, and unconstitutional use of stop and frisk by Philadelphia police. In this episode, we hear from the Reverend Mark Tyler of Power, Yahara Galarza, a community ambassador for ACLUPA, and Mary Catherine Roper, former deputy legal director of the ACLU of PA. Mary Catherine is now an attorney with the law firm Langer, Grogan, and Diver, and is co-counsel in the lawsuit Bailey v. City of Philadelphia, the case that challenged the city police department's use of stop and frisk. This conversation was recorded on March 29th. Well, Mary Catherine, Yahara, Reverend Tyler, thank you all for joining me to talk about this issue. It's really great to have all three of you here on the podcast. Well, it's great to be here. It's such an important issue. So we're talking about stop and frisk, which, let's be frank, never went away in Philadelphia. The Philadelphia police uh, have continued to use it, uh, but it is in the news uh, because there are candidates for office for city council and for mayor um, who have been talking about it, talking about possibly even escalating it. So I want to talk with all three of you about that. Um, But Mary Catherine, I want to do a little bit of background here. You've been deep in the weeds on the legality and the outcomes of Philadelphia police use of stop and frisk over the last 13 years. So let's start with the basics. Why did ACLUPA sue the city in 2010 over what police were doing with pedestrian stops? And how have things changed in the 13 years since then? Well, when the Nutter administration came in in 2008, they ramped up stop and frisk by Philadelphia police officers, almost doubling the number of stops um, by the time you got to 2009, 2009 was the high mark, like over a quarter million stops of pedestrians alone, not even counting cars in Philadelphia that year. Um, over 70% of them, some, something like 75% of them people of color. Um, and uh, we learned from just talking with people um, that an awful lot of uh a lot of the time there didn't seem to be any reason for the stop after we sued and we got to start looking at what the police wrote down as their reasons for the stop that confirmed that police were stopping people without a legal reason to do it. You have to have a certain level of, of information, suspicion that someone's involved in a crime. You can't just stop them for no reason, but police were stopping people for no reason. And in fact, in huge numbers, more than 40%, close to 50%, of the stops. So that means in 2009, over 100,000 illegal stops of Philadelphians, the vast majority of them people of color. So that's why we sued. Philadelphia uh, entered into an agreement that they would, uh, police officers wouldn't stop people without a legal reason, that we would get to monitor the reasons uh, that police were stopping people. and I, and it became sort of a real push for improvement, but it was very small and very slow until the Kenny administration came in. Um, and when Mayor Kenny appointed uh, Richard Ross as police commissioner, we finally saw some movement. Um, he really cracked down on illegal stops. And what do you know, when police stopped uh, being able to stop people for no reason, stops started coming way down, right? Um, today, uh, there are many fewer stops. Police give legal reasons for most of the stops. Um, 
But one thing that has never changed is the racial disparity. We still have more than 70% of stops are people of color. Um, and you, we see no good reason for that, especially in neighborhoods that are majority white, but the majority of people stopped are black. So our new challenge is we have, uh, the court has ordered a bunch of additional reforms um, to require the city to really deal with these racial disparities. They are reducing uh, stops for you know low level supposed crimes like holding an open can of beer. And there are a number of steps that are trying to force police uh, captains and lieutenants to be held accountable for the racial disparities in their own um, divisions. Um, those changes are gonna take a lot of work and a lot of leadership before we see results um, with respect to racial disparities. Reverend Tyler, I wanna ask you about the organization you're a part of, you're a part of the leadership with power. Um, it's been an organization that's been involved in this issue for a long time. First of all, tell us about what power does and your role there. Sure, so I started as just a um, clergy member of power. Uh, we are a congregational based organization that began in Philadelphia, oh man, it's been maybe since uh, 2010. When we first started uh, Power, we um, had this ambitious idea that we could somehow change the city of Philadelphia on its own. What we quickly discovered is that Philadelphia is so interdependent upon Harrisburg with the issue of preemption, which comes into play in a very significant way around the police contract in particular, that we had to expand our footprint and so Power works on education funding for K through 12. We had a very big win uh, in the way in which the state government now funds public education. We were a part of that fight. We have been fighting for a living wage for folk. But um, Power, now Pennsylvanians organized to witness, empower, and rebuild. Um, from my perspective and where I sit now as the co-director of Power Live Free, um, I work mostly on police accountability issues with a team of great lay people and clergy persons and partners at times like the ACLU, the Defenders Association, activists in the community around issues um, primarily again of trying to hold the police department, in this case in Philadelphia, accountable to the people. And I think it's really important to not lose sight of the impact that um, stop and frisk can have on a person, on the person who's been stopped. I, I remember one of the very first meetings I sat in on this issue. It may have been a decade ago. It was actually with several leaders from power and they were talking about, and you may have been there, Reverend, for, I can't quite remember who all was there, but I do remember um, some of your uh, organization's leadership talking about like what that experience is like. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Like what what's it like for the person who has to go through it? Yeah, well, so, I mean, we have to, I think, frame this in the context of the larger issue. So stop and frisk is an issue in Philadelphia, but it is systemic across the United States. And I'd say really anywhere that, you know, people of color have experienced colonization. And it really begins with the premise that the rights that have been identified in the laws don't apply to everybody. And so the idea that due process is something that we have written down, but if you are black, if you're brown, that that really doesn't apply to you. You know, I mean, the idea that your house is your castle. No, that's somebody else's castle, but not yours. We can come in anytime we want with or without a warrant. And it happens uh, most frequently as people are just out as pedestrians, sometimes in cars. The very first time I was stopped. Now, think about this. I grew up in Oakland, California, and I was born in 1966. So this is sometime in the early 1970s. A group of my friends were on our way to play baseball back when young black kids played baseball. And so we've got baseball bats. We've got gloves. We've got the ball. We have bases. Literally, we'd carry bases to the next neighborhood and we'd play. So we're on our way to meet some kids at the next neighborhood. Nobody in the group, I would imagine, is even over 14 we are stopped by the Oakland police, which uh, you all know um, because of their uh, behavior led to the formation of the Black Panther Party the same summer that I was born. And as I'm as we're walking, we're stopped by OPD. And they ask us, where are you going? 
I mean, you know, we're kids, so we're sarcastic. We're like, I mean, we're going to go play baseball. We got, so, I mean, they treat us immediately as though we're a gang, as though all we have are bats. They see none of the rest of the of it. And there's this long conversation. We're eventually allowed to keep on going and, you know, have the game. But for my life, now in my mid-50s, most of my interactions with law enforcement have been that way, where it is overly intrusive. It is, you know, the kind of questions that my uh, colleagues who are rabbis, who are white clergy people, never experience. The, you know, a traffic stop that begins with the question of where are you going, where are you coming from, what do you have in the car? Is If I ran a stop sign, give me the ticket for the stop sign, let's keep it moving. And so this is, but but this is normal, right, for persons that look like me. And at one point, I used to think you age out of it. But again, in my mid 50s, I've discovered that you never really age out of it. And so whether I'm dealing with a young white cop or an older one, or even black cops at uh, times who have adopted those same behaviors, again, it is the fact that I have no rights that anyone is bound to respect. And so I think that we have to always keep the, the, the indignity that comes along with stop and frisk. You know, if you're on a date, if you're with your family, if you know, you're on your way to a job interview, the idea that you are just immediately treated as a suspect or a suspicious person is, um, again, just uh, demeaning at, at, at best. And yeah, Harry, you're part of uh, ACLUPA's Community Ambassador Program. This is a program that we started about a year and a half ago, if I, re if I remember correctly. Um, first of all, tell us a little bit about that program and how it works. Hi, yes. Um, so basically, um, yeah, I was one of the community ambassadors. So it was a couple of districts um, because it's not through the whole uh, Pennsylvania. So I am um, directly from 24th district. Um, I'm also bilingual. So it helped out a lot, especially like people that we couldn't reach out to that only spoke Spanish. Um, so basically what would happen, we, we engaged with people, gave them pamphlets, um, flyers, uh, letting people know, you know, about the stop and frisk and the changes that had, uh, had occurred due to the stop and frisk, which is like minor offenses. So basically, the cops are still going to conduct. Um, um, they're just going to conduct it in a different manner. So instead of stopping uh the individual and frisking them right off the back, they're just going to simply just ask them, "Hey, stop what you're doing," or not, you know, bring it to their attention. Now it's, it's different. They will give them some time. I mean, if they continue to escalate or get out of hand, you know, they're going to proceed with a stop and frisk or not with other uh, violations or charges uh, to the individual. Um, I find it more better um, because at the end of the day, we're dealing with people. These are not, people are not items. Um, and I feel like I haven't really seen people in different categories as I see it now that I came back uh, to uh, Philly. So it's like really hands-on especially in my neighborhood is basically the ones that are targeted is either the browns uh browns or black hispanics um and it's simply because either they misunderstood they feel targeted a lot of them just have mental mental um health issues or they have some behavior issue and it's a lot to do with adjustment as well um i do help out with a lot of resources so i f feel like people don't know what's out there and they need to know what's out there. Um, far as like our legislators, the new mayors coming out and stuff, I think they just should make it known that they actually out here for the community, not just in the places that they see that is beneficial. Um, because in our, our areas that are targeted and stuff, there's a lot of poverty and there's a lot of places that got shut down for these young kids and that's out was out here and stuff is these young kids they don't know the law they don't know the changes what's going on uh, it's basically as they see they follow but i find i didn't get no negative feedback from giving people information educating them more about you know aclu about the um lawsuit that happened and it's just people knowing their rights as a human being because if we could conduct how we come and communicate with a person it will change the whole inside and the demeanor because some people don't know how, how when they target it or how to act, um, especially they get nervous. So, I mean, if you come at me for no reason, I'm not doing nothing. Some of them just outlash. 
And the changes you're talking about have been mm-hmm. implemented in six police districts where based on a number, if someone's engaged in any one of a number of minor offenses, they don't go through the official process of, of, hey. of a stop. Yeah, Mary hey. Catherine, uh, go ahead. We're actually up to uh, 11 districts now. Oh, about that oh oh, okay when i (laughs) started i think it was it was six okay that's that's very good that's very good Um, yeah and this program is a as you described you it's a way to um for police to not be engaged in actual stops and 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 if it escalates to that point of a frisk um we've heard reverend tyler describe what that experience is like what kind of feedback do you hear from people in the community when you're engaging them um, I engage with a lot of people. Um, we're talking about just regular pedestrians, my neighbors, my family. Um, also with people, um, they have their own business or nonprofit. Because at the end of the day, I want to hear from everybody. And that's our job. You know, we want to get the feedback from the people that have businesses out here that if it affects them, if they don't. Um, I didn't get no negative feedback. It was more just as long as they not doing nothing, don't provoke. Um, certain people, especially from the neighborhood that we are, um, they just want to build trust and know that no matter what, we have uh, police presence um, here when we need them and they could come, you know, as fast as possible, which now since the whole stop and frisk this last year, over here, they conduct a lot of stuff differently. So they in more, I would say almost in every block or every other block, there's like a, a lot of people, a lot of movements, but they still there just to observe and watch which is good. Um, they just want to know that, hey, we could trust the cops. They're here um, when we need them, but not target either the business or the people because um, at the end of the day, some people, they just stand around, they talk. If they're not doing nothing incriminating, I mean, they shouldn't be a target because at the end of the day, we want them, we want the police officers to do their job and actually do the stops that are accurate and that we getting the feedback that we want. It's not just stopping and harassing somebody just because either they know them due to the fact of their criminal history before they know their family or not from the area that they in. Because at the end of the day, I mean, time has changed. We can't even sit on our porch no more. I mean, and for me, I mean, that's, that's just uh, unfair. I really don't, I don't like being like that. And I hang out with a, a lot of people. So I'll be in the business and I, I'll still be around here. Cause at the end of the day, when I leave out of here, these are the people that motivate me and they help me grow. I was born here. So I want to make a difference. And a lot of things that people ask for is a lot of resources and support and understanding. Well, all three of you are very invested in the city. And I want to ask all all three of you to react to the fact that stop and frisk has come up as a topic in city council and, and, mm-hmm. and the mayoral race. And we're not we're not here to talk about any particular candidates, but candidate, but it has been floated by some. They're not. I don't think they're actually using the word escalate, but that essentially is what they're there. They seem to be t- implying is that they want more use of stop and frisk. And I, and I just want to throw that out for this question out for all three of you just to get your reaction. And when you hear that, um, you know, what's your what, what do you think about that? And, and why is that a bad idea? And I just um, let me jump in real quick, because um, I want to follow up what Yahira just said, which is, um, I think where a lot of the conversation about stop and frisk and policing tactics in general get misconstrued, you know, often here, you know, white folk in particular who are not familiar with our community, who don't do the kind of deep work that the two of you do and others that I know and work with, um, they'll hear someone like me or like you hear and they say, you just want lawlessness, you know, you hate the cops. And it's like, no, I mean, like, if you look at the people who have been shot in the city over the last year, and you look at the the demographics, most of them look like me, right? They've been Black men, and they've been killed very often by Black men. And so the kind of, you know, to hear you, Yahira, talk about, you know, not being comfortable even sitting on a stoop on a nice day. I mean, what part of Philadelphia is safe anymore? You know, how many times we're going to hear that never used to happen in this particular neighborhood. So we have a vested interest in safety, in public safety, and we want a city that's safe, but we also don't want to return to a dragnet mentality. You know, you remember that show, that old TV show, Dragnet, which everybody thought was cool, where somebody does something and they literally just drag a net over the entire community. 
But that uh, that type of policing doesn't work. I mean, the Bailey case and everything was based on the fact that if you stop like 200,000 people and you're only coming up with, you know, things that are contraband and, and, and the percentage is one to three percent, that's horrible policing is lazy policing. It breaks community trust and it doesn't do anything about the people who are actually out there killing people. Right. So, I mean, I am a pastor. I have to bury people when they're murdered and have to console families who are left behind. I take no pleasure in that. And but at the same time, I think that elected officials owe it to us not to go to the knee jerk reaction of what sounds good and is a good sound bite. But we have to do the hard work of knowing who the people are who are committing the crimes, focusing on them and allowing the rest of us to be citizens and not carry the burden of, you know, the fact that one black person did something. Therefore, all black people are a part of this. So, again, I'm sorry, I want to jump in. But and, and so I am not in favor of any candidate coming up with saying anything remotely close to let's go back to the quote unquote good old days of stop and frisk because there were no such good old days. And Reverend Tyler, I wanted to follow up with you because um, I wanted to f- hear some more of your thoughts about um, the, your thoughts on the next mayor and the next city council on how you'd like to see them uh, address public safety. What 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 are your hopes and expectations um, for the next administration? Yeah, so power, as I said before, we are um, we we are involved in a number of different campaigns in the city, and from our perspective what makes for public safety is pretty simple, right? I mean, it's the same formula that works in the suburbs. You know you know what keeps crime down in the suburbs? It's the fact that people have good paying jobs, living wage jobs. People have schools that actually, you know, have the resources that they need. And when you have, you know, good paying jobs and good schools and stable families, then miraculously crime goes down. So we need to find a way to actually raise the wage in Philadelphia. Again, we get back to preemption. Harrisburg can tell us what we can and cannot do around our um, minimum wage, but we've got to deal with that and find a way around it because nothing will make us more safe than putting food on people's tables and taking away a lot of the incentives that have people in the streets doing what they're doing. I mean, I don't know when this is going to air, Andy, but just an, a, a very small like example is the water crisis that we're going through now. This is March 29th. So if this is like months from now, just go Google that date and you will see empty shelves, right? I mean, Sunday, everybody had water. We got word that there's a threat that there's no water and people got desperate and everybody turned into a hoarder, right? Because people were looking out for themselves. So we can't ever think that we're above something When a community doesn't have resources, people act in a desperate way. And if we fix that problem, I think we also bring all the shootings down, bring down the crime and bring down the things that make us feel less safe. And this will be posted on April 6th. So I have no doubt that the water situation in Philadelphia will still be fresh in everybody's mind. So but thank you for raising that. It's a good, a good, uh, good point. Uh, Mary Catherine, I wanted to ask you about the future of the Bailey litigation. You know, we're still enforcing the settlement. You've talked a little bit about some of the progress, but also some of the problems that that still exist. Um, what's next? I mean, what's the legal strategy? What's the path forward? It seems like a lot of the power is in the hands of the next mayor um, and the police department. So real change within the police department needs to be supported by police leadership. It needs to be enforced by police leadership. That's how we finally got changes with respect to the the use of stop and frisk was uh, when we had new leadership under the Kenny administration. Um, We have uh, right now an ambitious plan for addressing racial disparities within the police department that's going to require leadership from the top. It's gonna require leadership and accountability at the captain level. um, And it's going to require sustained attention and and engagement with these issues. That's what we need. And uh, I will say like, it's, it's kind of hard when there are other crises going on, particularly the issues with gun violence um, for the police to, 
invest what they need to invest to fix these racial disparities, but they've got to do it because this is a problem uh, that has been in existence for, well, probably as long as there's been a Philadelphia police department. But we, we find, you know, we, we have uh, the tools to change that history of, of racial targeting of oppression of black and brown communities by the police um, and uh, change our police department into um, an organization that is focused on public safety without regard to uh, what people look like. We need to grab that. We need to move with that. We're working on building our community, not keep on breaking it down. There's a lot of stuff going on, especially like, I don't even think we came back from like the pandemic. Everything's opening up now. And I feel as though, you know, we got to have the resources out here. We got to have the right path, especially for a lot of people. Um, so if you see like pictures from 2015, 16, and then now is like, wow, it really, it was, it's a lot. And the mental health out here is is really real, especially in this district that, um, you know, that we changing the stopping for us. Um, is basically building a community back on um, bringing the people back together and having back what's called what was, you know, a safe zone. A lot of people don't even know what that is or question what is that because it's, it's sad to say, but a lot of stuff that's going on now is normal to people, you know, so I'm not saying when they do see or they live in what they live in, they rather just stay quiet because of a fear or they scared that their loved ones is going to be hurt. But at the same time, they still got to maintain. So we do got to take that into consideration. But as far as being a uh, community leader and doing um, Stop and Frisk, you know, with the ACLU, I took pleasure. Um, I enjoyed it as well because getting to know different people's situation, their feedback, and just acknowledging the people and talking to them, um, you know, face-to-face, -face, it actually made a difference and actually opened me up to a lot of things that I wasn't aware of as well. Well, we appreciate your involvement, Yahara. You, you did great work uh, in that community ambassador program. It, it's it certainly seems like this is an issue that's going to go on. And, and Reverend Tyler, did you want to chime in as well? Yeah, I just want to say that I mean, you know, I think it's important, and I'm glad Yahara started off by acknowledging the role of the ACLU. Um, you know, as sometimes, so from my perspective as a community organizer with an with an organizing effort like Power. That um, you know, we have these ideas. We we sense there's something wrong. We've done a lot of conversations with people, and you need partners who have the resources and the capability to really help further what you know to be right. And so, I mean, I hope that the ACLU uh, you know feels the same about groups like Power and other groups as like you know that it's this two way relationship. But I just you know really want to underscore how valuable the role has been. And I'm just glad to be back on here with Mary Cather and uh, as well, um, because it just seems like it was like yesterday that we were talking about this. So um, and as we know, as hearing these candidates kind of inch out there and think maybe we can dip our toe in the water and go back to stop and frisk. It just demonstrates how vigilant we have to always be and to stay on these issues all the time. So my hat is off to you all. Well, and I would just, you know, I don't know if this is going to fit in the conversation, but the the lawsuit is one thing. You know, the, the, the lawyers, the ACLU will continue using those tools to hold the police accountable to the and the city accountable to the promise it has made to make uh, to stop using stop and frisk in an illegal and and racially targeted way. But not, real change does not happen without pressure from the community. It was the community rising up around this issue in advance of uh, the mayoral campaign um, in which uh, Jim Kenney was elected that made stop and frisk an issue in that campaign and demanded that the next mayor make that a priority. And he did. And the next police commissioner made that a priority. Um, the lawsuit... Uh, was necessary, but it wasn't enough. We need both. We need the community work. We need power. We need the other voices of the community to uh, hold the city accountable to the promises it has made. 
And Reverend, if folks want to learn more about Power uh, and the work you're doing and, and support the organization, where can they go for more information? Thanks. You can go to uh, powerinterfaith.org and in this case, look for the Live Free campaign, which again is our work around police accountability and other related criminal justice issues. All right. Well, great. Thank you. Thank all three of you. Thank you to all three of you. Um, I really appreciate the time. This has been a really important conversation and I have a feeling it won't be the last one. We'll probably be talking about stop and frisk again at some point in the future, but um, you know, this is how the work gets done uh, and I'm hope, looking for more progress from the next administration. So thanks again. Thanks. Thanks you all. <laughs> Thank you guys. That's Mary Catherine Roper, Reverend Mark Tyler, and Yahara Galarza. Thank you again to all three of them for their insights and expertise. You can learn more about the Bailey lawsuit by visiting aclupa.org slash Bailey. That's B-A-I-L-E-Y. Be sure to follow ACLUPA on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, all with the handle at ACLUPA. And that brings episode 78 to a close. The editor of Speaking Freely is Natalie Montero. Our opening theme is by Moody Finn, and our closing theme is by Elliot. Both are courtesy of bensound.com. The acting executive director of the ACLU of Pennsylvania is Claire Landau. I'm Andy Hoover. Until next time, be free. <laughs>